Um, we went over a lot yesterday. I mean, it was all actually it was pretty much just a few people groups. Um, uh, today we're going to finish up with South America and then North America, both of which are very short. Uh, you will have noticed there was a very large section for Mesoamerica. I don't know why I didn't know it. Um, but it was cool. It was fun stuff, interesting stuff, thought provoking things for sure. Um, yeah, we aren't going to see too much of that from South America or North America as the only two people groups from South America we're going to talk about today are the Chauvin and Nazca people. And there's a couple more in your book, uh, but for time's sake and the fact that it's not on your exam, yeah. Um, and we're also going to get into Africa today, uh, too. Yep. Um, I am excited for that one. It's different stuff. Uh, and not what you would think of when you think of Africa either, which is cool. Uh, we are starting with the Chauvin. The Chauvin people are known for building very large towering monuments that existed even prior to the Olmec people, which were the oldest ones that we talked about yesterday from Mesoamerica. So the Chauvin predate them. They also, fun fact, this is just a random fun fact, they mummified their dead 500 years before the Egyptians ever thought about doing it. So a fairly advanced society, I would think, um, in comparison to some of the others. They also uh, created a lot of relief sculptures. Um, we're going to see one. I put up the cartoon version of it too, uh, but first I'll give you a little info before we look at it. Uh, it's a steely, so it's a really long, tall piece of stone with relief carvings in it. It is muddled and hard to read, which is why I put the cartoon sketch next to it so you could actually figure out what it is. It's a pretty cool steely, though, because you can turn it one way or the other way and you'll see different things each time, which is fun. Once again, that duality that we talked about yesterday translates even over into South American art. Um, the Chauvin people consider themselves to be the mother culture of the Andes. They are very old, but um, they're actually from the north. <laughs> so not really the mother people of the Andes. They have been traced up into the area of Mexico originally, and then they moved down south. Um, but yeah, pretty interesting people. The steely that we're going to look at is a picture of the staff god. We skipped another artwork that's of that same staff god, but there's a particular trend in South American cultures of depicting this same god. There's different ways of depicting them, but the commonality is they're always carrying a staff, which is why we call them the staff god. Uh, he does have bared teeth. Funny enough, the other image that I'm not showing uh, also calls him a he, but I think it looks like an old lady. That's my personal thing. It's not. It just looks like an old lady. Uh, bare teeth, a big headdress, just like a lot of the other reliefs that we looked at yesterday. And a whole lot of snakes. Yesterday when we talked about snakes, it had to do with uh, like sacred authority. Today's snakes have to do with fertility of land. In South America, snakes were celebrated with, well, giving land fertility, which is weird think of. I mean, if I think of like a garden snake, then yeah. If I think of like a rattlesnake, then heck no. Heck, heck no. Um, <laughs> depends on the snake, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. though. So. I'm not a huge snake fan, though. Depends on the snake. Um, like I said, this image does have multiplicity or duality as it can transform. The god itself in the image is transforming uh, from a snake person into a human person. Um, he is coated in snakes. It's cool looking, honestly. I do think it's cool. Um, yesterday, we also talked about a lot of imagery of people in the middle of transforming into humans and animals. This one's a cool one. 
I contemplated taking it out, but I, I like it too much. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and here it is. Like I said, the actual image, you can read it, but it's a bit hard as a lot of the lines are not quite deep enough to read anymore clearly. Uh, so I do have the drawing here. Down below, you see the staff god. He is carrying two staffs. His teeth are bared. He does have, it looks, it reminds me of like a dragon face. It's not what it is, um, but it reminds me of a dragon. He has snakes coming off of his belt, clawed feet, and snakes coming off of his headdress in multiple spots here and up here as well. And like I said, if you were to flip this over, you would instead see a two headed monster. <laughs> You can see it. We can totally see it. I love it when I see you guys turn your heads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't so fall. <laughs> it's a fun image. Quite clever. It's not like it was ever displayed the other way, but there are multiple faces within that one image. Which is a Another people group from South America that you're probably more familiar with, the Nazca people. I think Brandon did a presentation over the Nazca people, the Nazca line. I think he did. Maybe he didn't. Maybe I'm thinking someone else. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, but the Nazca people, also located in Peru, uh, they are fairly unknown to us today. They did some funky stuff, like uh, you remember. Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, the people with the like long head. Yeah, yeah they yeah, would yeah. wrap their heads yeah, to schools. make them long. Uh, that was yeah, common trends for them. <laughs> um, yeah, like the neck. yeah, they, they did not do the neck, they just did the head. Okay. But we have a lot of their skulls in there. Funky so looking. Weird. Yeah. They did use irrigation. A lot of the towns were built near irrigation. A lot of these lines that we're about to look at uh, are linked with irrigation systems. And they are known for lines. Um, so they created very, very straight linear lines using stones and strings to hold them in place and use as measuring uh, to create images that today can only be seen from above. So they made these things, but they couldn't actually see them unless they climbed up to the top of a mountain that was nearby. Uh, but unfortunately, most of these are on very flat land, so they still probably wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, today, a lot of the highways intersect these as when the highways were being built, no one knew they were there. No one knew these were actually there until someone flew a plane over them. And they were like, oh my God, <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, to do it, they also took off the top layer of clay and calcite to, well, not the top layer of clay and calcite, the top layer of dirt to reveal the white clay and calcite below, which is why it looks like this. There's a whole bunch of these. Uh, this one's probably the most famous one in the hummingbird. Once again, these were done in 500. That was the year. A long time ago, they have stood up the test of time. Of course, they did have to be redone a little bit after their discovery as a lot of weeds and dirt had piled up over top. Uh, and now there are a lot of petitions to get them protected as people are trying to build on land near my. Cool. Here's the spider. It's pretty neat to think that a culture that was literally just using stones and sticks didn't actually see anything was able to do this. And the monkey. You can see all of the highway lines on this one pretty well. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Down to North America, um, and then we'll be done with the Americas. In North America, we're only going to talk about the Eskimos, Woodlands, and Southwest people. There's a whole lot of other art coming from North America. 
Um, but we're focusing on just those particular regions. And we're primarily focusing on the large architectural pieces created by them, except for the Eskimo people as they were nomads. Uh, so no large architectural pieces from them. There were a lot of different styles. There's not a particular style that you can look at, like the last section we talked about of Meso and South America. A lot of those things can translate as they had similar religions and similar methods of doing things. In North America, we don't have that. Every culture does their own version of art, which is also why we're not going to get into all of them because it would take a long time. Because you have your certain groups of people that are nomadic, there are certain ones that are not nomadic. Uh, and that tends to affect what kind of art you're going to make. Quite a bit. Starting off with the nomadic people, though, uh, the Eskimos, uh, their culture began around 500 BCE after crossing the Beringia uh, Strait or Bering Strait. Most of their objects are small, portable things. This is made of walrus tusk ivory, uh, several different pieces of walrus tusk, not one, and it was created to be small, lightweight, and carryable. They didn't have wood, which is why a lot of their art is made of walrus tusk. Which is kind of interesting to think about using different materials. Many people believe that this was meant to be a mask due to, well, the mouth part and the nose. <laughs> but it was it was at a burial site where it, when it was found. So a funerary mask, maybe very different funerary mask than the ones that we've looked at. Another portable object. Um, I don't remember. Did I, I? I think I talked about the smoking pipe in here one day, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think I showed it. But a lot of North American cultures, because smoking was a spiritual thing for them, they made a lot of pipes. Uh, this is a pipe. <laughs> um, of course, this one's in the shape of the man. The one that I showed the other class, it was a beaver and like you smoked out of a beaver's mouth. It, it, yeah, kind of cool. Um, these pipes were highly collected by Europeans and taken home and it ends up sparking a trend in Europe to smoke as well. Uh, they don't use it for spiritual means. Uh, there's a lot of readings and excerpts of European men that smoke because they can like smoke on the pipe and prolong their answers to like give themselves time to think for good answers or things to sound more philosophical. I'm like, man, that's a good idea. I don't condone smoking, but <laughs> that's kind of smart. <laughs> but yeah, it, it all started with these North American cultures that made pipes. This one is from the Adena culture. Uh, they're known more for their large burial mounds, and they would bury these pipes with their dead. Um, once again, smoking was a very spiritual thing for them. Morning, you made it, good. Um, so it kind of makes sense that they would bury a dead member of society with one as well uh, to take with them. It's a very interesting shape uh, for a figure. He's in a crouching pose. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever done like jump squats. It kind of reminds me of that pose. Uh, it is a movement oriented pose. It's not like he's just standing there. They are trying to make it look like he's jumping. Um, but still, his legs are obviously not proportionally correct. His arms are very long and his head is large. 
Yeah, we'll see the large head be a popular trend for today's lesson. Um, the rest of the people that make large heads, we know why. <laughs> These guys, it's just an interesting stylistic trick. Uh, as I said, the Adena people are more well known as mound builders, which is what it sounds like. <laughs> so we're talking about giant mounds of dirt. We're going to be looking at next giant mounds of dirt. Um, my personal favorite is located in Illinois. It's the one that I always want to go to, but nobody ever lets me. Uh, my family's from Illinois, and we drive past Cahokia every year, and nobody lets me stop. <laughs> I think the solution to this problem is whenever you get into Illinois, you yeah. drive, and then you just force everyone. Yeah, to but that would require me to drive through downtown Chicago, and that is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> priorities, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the largest mound at Cahokia is Monk's Mound, but there are a lot of mounds located there. Monk's Mound is 100 feet tall. Uh, these mounds, uh, they would periodically add another layer of dirt every year, like to make it taller. <laughs> um, it's literally just piles of dirt. At the top of these dirt piles, they would have wooden structures, possibly related to religion. Um, yeah, some of the mounds were used as burial mounds, and they found objects buried there as well as artifacts. Um, so it's pretty cool. There's a lot of history there. And here is Monk's Mound. Uh, and to give you kind of an aerial view of what things would have looked like, Monk's Mound is located in the center with the wooden structure at the top, and you can see all of the other mounds around it. There's a lot. A lot of mounds. Lots of dirt. This also looks like it'd be really fun. So this is just a little fun side note. Uh, at my childhood home growing up, we had an acre of land in our backyard with a very, very large hill, which I love to roll down. This is like prime rolling downhill real estate here. A hundred feet worth. <laughs> I'm in a good mood today, sorry guys. I'm a little hyper, I had caffeine, which I don't usually. Um, Okay, it makes for a fun lesson, I guess. I don't know. Uh, another mound building culture <laughs> is uh, located in the woodlands. Uh, this is the serpent mound. This one's not so much just a pile of dirt. There's an actual shape to it. <laughs> uh, it is located in Ohio right next to a creek. This one's on your test if you remember too. Yeah, uh, you're supposed to uh, write about uh, its location people's reactions. This one's a more opinion-based question though. Like, what do you think people would have thought in the area of seeing it the first time kind of thing? Um, but it is located right next to the creek. You can kind of see a bit of the creek peeking through here in the picture. Uh, it is 1,200 feet long. I know it doesn't look like it in the picture. It's a bit sized down here. Uh, but if you were to walk from tail to the top portion here, it does count up to 1,200 feet. Um, once again, another one that we didn't know was there for a while, just because you do have to see it from above. Uh, at its thickest sections, it's five feet wide at the, well, 20 feet wide, my bad. And at the tallest sections, it's five feet wide. I did put in the dimensions on this one. I don't always do that for every single thing, but this one, I feel like the pictures don't do it justice and you do really have to imagine the size dimensions to grasp it. Uh, I've had friends that went to this. They said it was amazing. It's generally like a really quiet, gorgeous, parkish feeling area, which you can kind of tell from the picture. There's not many people that go out there, so you can just spend your time walking around it. Uh, we don't quite know why it's here. 
It does not have anything to do with burials like Cahokia. It does not have anything to do with, well, most people speculate it doesn't really have to do with religious ceremonies. Uh, snakes, once again, symbol of fertility also for these people. So possibly relating to that, it does look like a snake eating an egg. Historians believe that it might be a depiction of Haley's Comet. And that is thanks to the Bayou Tapestry. You guys remember that one? Yeah, yeah. So in the Bayou Tapestry, it was recorded that a year before this one was made, um, this, this mound, uh, the brightest ever passing of Haley's Comet occurred. <laughs> And they illustrated it on the Bayou Tapestry. And scientists have determined that that was the brightest passage of it yet um, to ever happen. So these natives <laughs> saw this really, really bright light just pass across the sky. And if you're familiar, comets, they, they have tails. Uh, so some people think that this is Haley's Comet here. Or maybe they thought it was the serpent god in the sky. Who knows? Maybe. Uh, we don't really know. There's not objects with this one. There's not dead people with this one. Yeah. <laughs> if that grosses you out, Cahokia does have dead people. That doesn't bother me for whatever reason. I don't know why. The children the other day were a bit much, yeah. I think there's only been one place that I've been really creeped out going to, and that was Yuma, Arizona's prison. Uh, there's a really old prison in Yuma. It was supposed to be the toughest prison to break out of and most like the, the worst one to go to. If you've ever been to Yuma, the loudest place in America. <laughs> you would not want to do them. They made them do manual labor. I wouldn't want to go there. And a lot of people died. Um, of heat stroke and dehydration. There's a lot of really famous criminals that went there too. Um, my father made us go in July. The worst part is the prison's right next to the Rio Grande River, but you can't get to the Rio Grande. So it's just like water. Prison. That's so mean. I couldn't even do it. I wasn't even a prisoner. It's just cruel. Anyways, uh, that's the only place I've ever been to that creeped me out because I knew a lot of people died and the cells were creepy. And solitary was like literally in a dark hole in the ground. And I went in it and it was terrifying. But yeah, no, going to other places like Cahokia doesn't bother me. <laughs> Even though I know there's a bunch of dead people there. Cemeteries don't bother me at all. Prison does. <laughs> um, now, in the southwest United States, the there, there's a lot of cultures in the southwest as well, but probably the most famous one is the Pueblo people, known as the um, Anasazi by the Cherokee people, but that's kind of a derogatory term. It, it translates to something like the enemies. <laughs> um, so the Pueblos prefer to be called Pueblo. Even today, there are quite a few Pueblos left. Um, they're known for creating very advanced cities and urban settlements, the first of which was located in New Mexico in Chaco Canyon. You can go visit. I've been. It's cool. Uh, there's not much left of that one. It's pretty much just rubble, very little rubble left. It was built in a semicircle, um, and it had 800 rooms and five levels. Like I said, there's not really anything left there. You'll see a picture in a second. After a long drought, they decide to go to Mesa Verde and they build another urban city into the cliffs there. They actually use the cliffs as a form of AC and heat, um, which is kind of cool to think of. It had 200 rooms. So uh, during the winter, it catches the sunlight in that area. 
And during the summer, the cliff shadow kind of shelters them and gives them shade from the sun. So, yay. Although if you were at the very, very back of that settlement, you did not benefit. Prime real estate guys at the front. They also had kivas, which were, they kind of look like wells, but they weren't wells. They're large circular chambers that go into the ground and men would go in there for spiritual purposes. Women were not allowed. I wouldn't want to go. It's a hole in the ground, I don't want to go. This is the Chaco Canyon residence. Like I said, there's not too much left. I've been to this one. I have not been to this one. I've been to some other small Pueblo dwellings. You been to that one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This, um, this one. Yeah. Of, it's cool. It's so cool. I've been to some of the other cliffside dwellings that they have around New Mexico, um, mm -hmm. but not to this one. This one's the largest. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. But you can see it goes pretty far back into that cave cliff area. The kivas are the circular things at the front. Right. You can walk in there, but you don't actually expect it to be that big. No, it's huge. Like, you can go in there. Yeah. Like, Holy crap. Yeah. I, I can fit a lot of people in there. <laughs> or you can be like my father and go to the ones that are not tourist attractions. They're uh, in the middle of nowhere and uh, yeah. through rattlesnake territory. <laughs> it's what we did. Yeah. Fun family vacations. We go to a prison and we go to the desert. <laughs> yeah. So in summary for the Americas, before we move on to Africa, Mesoamerica, South America, North America, there's a large diversity of art. There's a little bit more linking South and Mesoamerica, North America, very, very, well, not super different. I mean, they're still doing burial things, but very different burial things. Um, not so much the human sacrifices thing. There are people groups that did do human sacrificing and had slaves. Um, not quite as rampant, though, in the art. <laughs> um, uh, so was there a particular people group yesterday in Mesoamerica that you guys really enjoyed? If so, why? Or an artwork that you liked a lot? <sighs> But in general, I really liked a lot of the different temples. Just because yeah. That's like been something that like just amazes me about like you know they built these huge yeah centuries ago, and they didn't <clears throat> they didn't have the kind of technology that we have. Today. Right, makes sense. Impressive. Anyone else want to share? Um, I mean, I really enjoy the architectural stuff. I've been to Mesa Verde and I've been to a couple of the different, like, um, the Navajo. Mm -hmm. elements, like, Pueblo. Yeah. So there, it's really interesting to see how they've taken, like, the natural, yeah. like, stone and stuff and turned it into basically, like, a whole city. Yeah. And we're going to see that happen in Africa, too, in a second. They're going to do the same thing. Um, I don't know if I have a particular favorite. Uh, anything that teaches me more about cultures in general that I'm not super familiar with, I usually like a lot <laughs> um, or find it really interesting. So uh, that's why I don't really have a favorite. It's not that I didn't like any of it. It's just I don't know. I found a lot of the pieces very enlightening, and I like that. That takes us into Africa, uh, which is the last chapter. Uh, by the way, your final exam opens, I think. Yeah, it opened. Um, and uh, you guys will have everything that you need to take it. Uh, I am recording this. I recorded yesterday's too. It's posted. Uh, for anyone that needs that. If you remember yesterday at the beginning of class, we went over the test too. So if you want to know the questions beforehand, check that out. But in Africa, uh, it's pretty much lined out just the same way uh, the Art of the Americas was, um, but a lot more sparse. <laughs> 
I kind of hinted it yesterday. There's large pieces of history when it comes to Africa that we just don't have. Um, one, because a lot of the languages are lost to us. Two, because nobody really wrote down things. It was a lot of oral history. Oral history is not super clear all the time. Uh, there's no precise dates. And a lot of the artwork from Africa was stolen in illegal excavations and then sold illegally. Yeah, so we don't have a lot, which is very unfortunate and very frustrating for our historians. Uh, there is also a lot of diversity. You can kind of see in that first line, there's 52 nations and over 2,000 ethnic, cultural, and linguistic groups. Uh, so there's not really like a theme here uh, as far as the art at all. <laughs> uh, a lot of differences. You will see some things that uh, most of these African cultures do, though they work in similar mediums. That's because that's what they had available in that region. Uh, so you probably are already thinking, well, what does Africa have a lot of? Stone and wood, yeah. Uh, so those are our, going to be our main medium choices today. Uh, we'll come across some bronze later once bronze casting starts. Uh, to start off a lot of wood and stone stuff. Uh, and I'm saying that because that was a test question too, if you remember. <laughs> um, also, thinking back to our Paleolithic era chapter, this is where the very, very first art ever came from. That's because, well, people supposedly originally, originally came from Africa. Therefore, it makes sense that art would come from there too, as well as everything else. Um, we aren't going to go all the way back to that time because we've already talked about a bunch of it. Uh, we're going to pick kind of right up where we left off with Africa today. Um, there are some similarities between core beliefs. You'll see some trends that do carry over, like I mentioned a second ago, that big head thing uh, that has to do with social status. I'll talk more about it when we see one in a second because I think it's our first image. Um, we are focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. That's because we already talked about <laughs> the rest of Africa when we went over Mesopotamia and Egypt. Yeah, so we don't need to. We went in depth on those. We're good. Um, but you can divide Africa into two sections. There's prehistoric art, meaning art before anything was being recorded, and then 11th through 18th century art. If you'll notice, we are going all the way into the 18th century. That is the furthest that we've gone in any art section. Why? I don't know. Because your survey too, if you take it, it picks back up at the Renaissance, which is the 1400s. <laughs> uh, starting off with prehistory, uh, the cultures that we're going to talk about today are the Tizali and Ajir. The Nok and the Igbo people. That I can't talk, but I said that word. <laughs> uh, so we already know they did a lot of cave paintings in Africa. We looked at those. They also did a lot of rock art, which makes sense. Uh, you guys have already mentioned that they probably use a lot of rock. It's an easy medium to come by. Um, it is the earliest known art form from Africa. Terracotta does become popular once they figure out how to use it. And make it, particularly with the Nock people and the Liedenberg people. If you're interested in the Liedenbergs, they are in your book. They do similar stuff to the Nock, though, yeah. kind of more abstract, but similar. And later on, at the tail end, as we are transitioning into the Bronze Age, the Igbo people use bronze casting, which is around when everyone else picks up bronze casting. Bronze casting too, so yeah, we're on trend. Uh, something that a lot of people don't realize or take into consideration is that a lot of African art is quite advanced. And I feel like because we do learn things from a European point of view, we don't think of that. 
but you will see some pretty impressive stuff, at least in my standards, as far as technology uh, and use of the technology, as well as sculpting today. So we're going to see a lot of sculptures, a whole lot of sculptures. Starting out there with uh, some rock art. This is a 7,000 year old painting uh, done on a rock wall. Uh, this is called Pictograph. You don't need to know that, but um, it's a pictograph. It's a picture of a rock <laughs> um, depicting a woman. Most people think that she is a goddess now. Originally, they weren't sure. She is wearing a horned helmet. Uh, so they chose an interesting way to showcase her. She's running this way in profile view. This is like her uh, head, nose, mouth, but they have the horn coming out to the side. That's because they wanted to make sure you saw both horns. If you remember back to a long, long time ago when we talked about cave paintings, they would oftentimes like twist the animal's head to make sure you shot, saw what you needed to see. That's that's twisted profile. Uh, they used it here for her as well. So obviously that horned helmet is important to determine who she is. Fortunately, it doesn't help us today. Um, but yeah, she must have been pretty important to be able to have that defining characteristic. She does have a lot of dots along her. That would be body paint. The other thing with Africa is that their most prominent art style is body paint. <laughs> you can't keep that. Uh, but you will see a lot of body paint references today and scarification. She doesn't so much have scarification, but we will see it in a second. Scarification is the art form of literally scarring your face. The more scars you had, the more beautiful and high profile you were in your society. That's another art form that like, we don't have it. <laughs> not something we can yeah uh, so that's another frustrating aspect about Africa is their most well-known artworks are not long-lasting and durable yeah yes we are going to look at a lot of art today but we can't look at the stuff that they're famous for um, but we can see references to it in their other art such as here uh, you'll notice there's a bunch of teeny tiny people too running around her. That's one of the main reasons why people think she's a god too, because the teeny tiny people, hierarchic scale. Um, yeah. Interesting one. Let's just take us into the Nok culture. The Nok culture is located in Nigeria. A lot of the cultures that we're talking about are located in Nigeria. That's just a little preface. Um, The Nott culture was working in terracotta. They were molding their terracotta and then setting out, out to dry and firing it in a fire pit. Uh, you'll notice that he has very interesting facial features. This was once an entire human body. We don't have the body for this one. There's some of them that they found the pieces of the body and they have learned that the heads are disproportionately large in comparison. Like I mentioned, it has to do with social con like hierarchy and constructs. Large heads were synonymous with ruling, <laughs> uh, like having the wisdom and power and authority to rule, which is weird. It's not like the people themselves actually had big heads, but they wanted their artwork to have big heads. Kind of like how in Rome they wanted to either look young or old or whatever to show off authority. It's just a different interpretation. I think almost every culture we've talked about in this class has done some form of that somewhere along the line. And I've decided I like this better than the Starbucks one. If you haven't tried it, it's delicious. I like the microwave. Yeah, I didn't. I, I'm a sucker for anything caramely. So, yeah. Um, like I said, interesting facial features, very large, alert eyes. His nostrils are flared. It's not that he has a big nose. He's flaring his nostrils, another sign of like authority and power. Um, and his mouth is open. The reason why the mouth is open is they think it might be for the firing process. Same with the holes in the eyes and the nose. 
with clay, you have to leave openings during the firing process or else it goes, it explodes because uh, air gets trapped inside and heat expands oxygen and yeah. Uh, so that's why most people think there's holes because they had to. <laughs> they might've done it without holes the first time and been like, oh. <laughs> uh, but there are reasons. He would have probably worn a beaded necklace here, which you can kind of see the remnants of also alluding to his authority. So most people think this is probably a king. You'll notice that common trend throughout most of the sculptures are of royalty in Africa. That's one of the linking trends there is that art was primarily done for the wealthy and high society people, which is another common trend in art. So still carries over today. Here is another artwork from uh, this particular prehistory era from the Igbo people. Like I mentioned, the Igbo people, once bronze casting comes about, they start making a lot of artwork with bronze, once again, primarily for the royal family. Uh, this is a bronze casting done in the lost wax casting method that would have been for the end of a whip. Yeah, that's a new one, huh? It's kind of utilitarian. It has a purpose and a function. That's a hint. <laughs> you guys remember that one from yesterday. Uh, so at the end of the whip, this would have been there. And the whip would have been attached. Of course, we don't have the whip anymore. Those are not long lasting things either. Once again, this would have been done for a ruler. Uh, on the end of the whip is a ruler himself. This is an equestrian statue. Not the first one we've talked about those either. <laughs> um, but a different kind of equestrian statue. So here we have the horse, and on top of it is the, once again, very disproportionately large ruler. That's a pretty common thing with equestrian statues, though. Uh, this horse looks so, so tired, though. <laughs> uh, poor horse. Um, the ruler is wearing his regalia of the, being the king. He had a particular headdress and sandals that he was supposed to wear to signify his position in society. That's exactly what is going on here. He is bigger than the horse once again because he's the authoritative figure. It's the same deal. It's amazing how like Everyone thinks Africa is backwards and behind, but hello, they're doing the same thing. Same thing. My gosh. Um, <laughs> down below, you'll notice there's beads that, uh, when this was brand new, would have looked like jewelry or ornamentation. Now it just looks like patina, which is what happens with things. That's still a cool one, though. So thus far, we've only looked at three things. The first one was a religious. The last two have been political. I'm just keeping track here for you. <laughs> Keep on track. It makes me so sad. My art appreciation class, the first day of class, I always ask them why, like, what's the purpose of art? And they're like, they free expression. I'm like, no, baby. <laughs> no, sweetie. I wish. Most art is not for expression. Um, that does take us into the 11th and 18th centuries, which is a big jump. <laughs> we went from prehistory to the 11th through 18th century, and we are once again primarily focusing on Nigeria at the beginning. The Ife uh, people or Ili Ife people are located in Nigeria. They are a very, very impressive society. You will see why in a second. Uh, working in um, terracotta, wood, and bronze once again. Then we will look at the Jin and Lalibea and Benin and Sapi people. Uh, it's during the 11th or 18th centuries that Europeans are starting to enter into Africa and then eventually they divide up and colonize it. When this happens, of course, they introduce Christianity 
Then from Northern Africa pushing down, you have Islam coming in. Primarily Islam is picked up very quickly in Ethiopia as well as Tunisia and other areas. So yeah, we have Christianity, Islam coming together in Africa. So it's through the 11th or 18th centuries, you're gonna see artworks and thinking of architecture specifically popping up to suit those new religions coming in. So more mosques, guess what it's called? The Great Mosque. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Uh, and some more churches too. <laughs> yeah, fun. Uh, you only thought we were done with Christianity. You only thought. That's where we're ending too. Uh, but first we're gonna talk about the Ili Ife people or the Ife people as I usually call them. They're from Yoruba, which is located in present day Nigeria. Um, yeah, they felt like the gods Adudua and Abatala created the earth. Later on, they will convert to Christianity as Europeans come in, but that is not their original religion. Uh, they were not Christianized when they are making these artworks that we're about to look at. They are known for having extreme naturalism in their facial structures, like supernatural, like classical Greek art levels of natural, which blows European minds away. Yeah, for a long time, Europeans felt like these had to have been made a lot later and like they learned how to do this through trade or something by looking at other art, but no, they did this on their own. Go them. I love their art, I think it's cool. So here uh, you see once again, a really big head <laughs> and a very teeny tiny body. Um, once again, signifying the social status of the ruler. This is a king. You should be able to tell that though from his ornamentation. He is wearing a very uh, fancy headdress, a lot of jewelry and fancy skirt and leggings or sandals. Um, all of the beadwork and this would have been a lot of gold too, uh, is something that only someone of very high social status would have been allowed to wear or able to wear uh, in their culture. Y'all didn't know I liked African art, did you? I figured from last time. Oh uh, yeah, I love African art. Um, my, like when I started off in my history degree, I focused on minority studies, uh, primarily on Africa and African American history. I love it. I can get into it. It's my favorite. So interesting and insane. There's so much going on that like nobody talks about, which is crazy. Same with their art. <laughs> um, so this is just the first one. I pulled a lot of these because this is like my favorite. This, I, I'll be honest, this is my favorite group. <laughs> uh, I think they're awesome. So I did pull this one. This is another head of a ruler. You'll notice all the lines. That's the scarification. The Ili Ife people did use scarification to show off status. The more scars you had, the higher you were in society. Men and women would go through this process and it's literally carving into your face and permanently scarring it. It's not paint, folks. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, but I love how fleshy everything looks. It looks so real. And this is bronze, by the way. Here's another one. <laughs> I really like the movie. <laughs> I think you can tell. I gave them priority, prime spot there. Um, this is seated man from Tada. Uh, the Tada people did not live with the Ili Ife, but most art historians believe this was done by an Ili Ife sculptor, sculptor and then purchased by the Tada. Normal Ili Ife sculptors and sculptures would only do royal figures. They would be standing in very ornamented regalia. This, however, is quite a bit different. He is sitting. He is not standing, there is no authority there, and he is not wearing anything fancy. So this is most likely a normal person, which is very rare in African art. It's very rare in art in general. You don't usually see normal people. He's also extremely relaxed, 
most of the poses, if you look back at this one, a bit stiff and rigid, um, very natural. It's so sad though, like if you look at the date on this, it's 13th to 14th century. By then we should have been able to like keep track of stuff. But because of all of the legal excavation, people didn't know what was real, what was fake, what was going on. Where did it come from? Because nobody was keeping track of it. They were just trying to get the stuff as fast as possible before anyone else could so they could sell it. Uh, uh, um, over in Mali, the art's a bit different. These are the Djen people statues. Once again, usually of uh, members that are a bit higher in society. Not always kings, sometimes kings. This one is a warrior. It's a little different. Um, I think this one's pretty interesting too. The face is very much in their style and their style alone there weren't any other cultures that were creating facial structures like that with that long chin um, the eyes and the nose are also typical to gen style this is like the ila ife known for naturalism the gen people known for long facial features um, so they each have their own style, but they're all very different. And in case you're wondering how I knew this was a warrior, he has a quiver on his back and on his hip right here, there was originally a knife. There's still kind of other remnants that kind of tell you he was a warrior. You can probably tell by looking at it though. Once again, terracotta. We're seeing materials still used even into the 15th century now that are common for the region. Also in Dijen, eventually they uh, pick up Islam as it comes down south. This was a little bit prior to that, uh, just by a few hundred years. Uh, here is our great mosque. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a bit of a different mosque than what we've seen so far. Uh, this one is all made of clay which is cool. Uh, if you notice, there's wood beans sticking out of it. That is because every year there's a festival in which everyone in society goes and adds more clay to the outside of it, like a festival of rebuilding and making sure mm -hmm. our temple doesn't fall or our mosque doesn't fall down. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they use the uh, wooden poles and beams sticking out of it as scaffolding to get to certain areas, which is fun. It's a fun, interesting festival. You don't have to pay architects or anyone. Kind of smart. Um, the Kibla or prayer wall, uh, Madara is what it's usually called, but they call it Kibla. Uh, face of Mecca, per the huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and inside and outside, you'll see it has a pretty typical mosque plan. Inside you have the hall in which the men would go into and pray regularly. Outside you have your courtyard for everybody else. It's cool and I do have a close up of this because I think those are neat. It gives it character. And it has a purpose. Dare say utilitarian. <laughs> Giving hints here. <laughs> Once again, a lot of the people uh, in Ethiopia end up picking up Christianity versus Islam. 
and they in turn build a lot of churches, particularly King Laozoa. Uh, he builds 11 churches. The interesting thing about all of these churches is they're all, all 11 of them are connected by underground tunnels. He goes on a building spree. A good chunk of these are also rock cut churches, meaning carved out of the natural rock that existed. So he found a bed of rock and carved the church into it. So this is technically underground a little bit, um, but it's cool, it, it's cool. And, and underneath it, of course, are the tunnels that link all the churches together. An interesting architectural plan that we haven't seen so far, linking all 11 churches. He did that to make pilgrimages easier for people. Um, like, hey, if you go to one, you can just go to all, all 11 pretty easily. They're all connected. <laughs> this is the Church of St. George. They don't call it St. George. They call it Beta Georgius. That's because that's how you say his name in their language. That is St. George. Uh, you remember the dragon guy? Yep. <laughs> Funny how things just carry over throughout life. Um, there are Islamic motifs here, as well as some Byzantine Christian motifs. So the windows, you'll notice they are your Islamic art. Um, but they were very, very invested in crosses from the Byzantine style. This is the aerial view of that church. Wow. It's cool. <laughs> Yeah. I'm also very impressed with this one. Like I said, there are 11 in total. This is just one of them. You can Google the others. But it is impressive. That does take us into the Benin people. Uh, Benin also doing some fairly naturalistic work, maybe not quite so natural as the Ili'ifi people, but still quite natural. This is a portrait of the queen of the Yoruba king, well, Benin king. So the Benin culture comes from the Yoruba culture, which come from the Ili'ifi people. Uh, so you can kind of see why it's similar to theirs, as they are descendants. It's just a different name and a different king. Uh, the Ile Ife end up changing into Benin over time as they are conquered. Uh, but the king of Benin, the first king, he was very indebted to his mother. He felt like it was thanks to his mother he was able to rule. Therefore, he had a couple of pendant portraits made of her, one for her to wear and one for him to wear. Yeah, some of you are finally soaking that into your head. I oh, yeah. wonder how long it's going to take them. Uh, so this is the Queen Mother. She is wearing um, a crown and necklace. The crown and necklace have alternating mudfish and Portuguese men. <laughs> uh, so the mudfish represent... Um, Fortune mudfish are representative of the god Olukan, who was in charge of the sea and wealth. And their primary primary means of making money was trade with the Portuguese. So here they have linked trade with the Portuguese with Olukan, who is represented with the mudfish. And not only is this a celebration of the king's mother, but also a celebration of their good fortune, as the Benin people did make a lot of money off of the Portuguese. A lot. So this is our first artwork that we've seen that has European influence, very interesting European influence, but it's not the last. Which makes sense, I mean. Europeans colonized them. I'll take them to the very last image. This is the last one. This is the last one, guys. This is it. So we're done. Uh, this is from the Sapi people. The Sapi people also benefited quite a bit from trading with the Portuguese. Uh, this is a salt cellar. I mentioned it yesterday. It holds salt 
Uh, so the lid, you can see where it opens here. Inside of that, salt would have been kept. Salt was a very, very precious commodity. It was used to preserve food. It could also help you from becoming um, like sick and dehydrated in deserts, which is, it sounds weird, but um, yeah, that's how it works. Nowadays, they tell you not to eat salt, <laughs> um, but it's very precious. I was listening to uh, something the other day that during um, the early days when Great Britain was being Christianized, a uh, basically ounce of salt would have costed a month's wage. So salt was expensive, bam. This thing held a lot of salt. This thing is also made of ivory, another expensive material. So this is expensive. Uh, <laughs> it's really just a symbol of wealth. It was commissioned by a Portuguese tradesman. And that tradesman was very interested in showing off how wealthy he was. He could afford a lot of salt and ivory and the sculpture to be made. So this is a form of tourist art. Uh, tourist art becomes very popular in Africa as they are going through colonization. Uh, just like the pipes that we talked about from North America as North America is being colonized, people want to pick up specific objects to take home to show off to people. Um, and this is just one of them. This does depict a very interesting <laughs> subject matter, though. If you read it, it's, it's an execution. Uh, so this man is the executioner. Uh, here we have someone who's waiting for his head to be cut off. There's a whole bunch of heads around him that have already been chopped off. Oh, Daniela. <laughs> She's like, ah! <laughs> um, down below, you might be wondering what's going on. So we have male and female figures being depicted. The men are wearing traditional Portuguese clothing, paying homage to the Portuguese culture. The women are wearing traditional sapi clothing, paying homage to the sapi culture. Um, we aren't sure if the artist had any stylistic choices in this or if it was denoted what the buyer wanted beforehand. Uh, as most of the time, people, when they take commissions around the world around this era, uh, actually until very recently, you would usually do what the buyer told you to do to make money. So we don't know. But it is obviously a very distinctly African style of art. It is a traditional sappy way of sculpting things. Once again, larger heads. This does not have anything to do with royalty, though. Uh, probably what happened is the Portuguese guy was like, I want stuff that looks like that. And yeah, we don't know. We don't know what happened. There's no paperwork on this. Um, but it is traditional African sappy style. And obviously, quite utilitarian. I've given you many choices for that one today. Yeah. So, that's actually it. Uh, in summary, Africa does contain some of the oldest known artworks. Unfortunately, you just don't have a lot of them because of poor records, which we can't fix. I mean, there's literally art historians that have dedicated their life to doing this. And, not much has happened, she said. Uh, there are a variety of mediums used, uh, but most of the mediums are from traditionally found objects nearby, like rocks or ivory or wood or clay. Bronze. Nigeria has large amounts of bronze, by the way. They end up setting mines there. Um, is there a particular one that you liked the most? I already told you what I liked the most, so I'm not going to say. <laughs> yeah. The salt. The salt cellar? Yeah, the salt cellar is quite a part of it. That's kind of like new age technology. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's all really unique and impressive. Yeah. Grace, do you have an opinion? Um, I really like the piece that showed the scarification. I just think it's interesting that like what we might look at as being just some kind of pattern has significance to them um, and their appearances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that too. That's one of the reasons why I like it as well. Um, yeah, I'm so sad. Was it? Uh, the only thing you have left to do is your final exam. Remember, it is 10 questions. We went over the questions yesterday. I recorded that if you need to review it. It's all written. There's no time limit. Uh, I need to change that one question yet, though. I'll do it in a second to <laughs> yes, no. Uh, there's a yes, no question on the test, Grace. Um, yeah, uh, it's the same as all your other quizzes, though. Nothing's really changed at all. Uh, I would like to say I really liked teaching you guys and getting to know the two of you that I didn't know a little bit more. Uh, I hope you guys do take more classes in the future with me. Maybe that'd be great. I'd appreciate it. It means a lot to me when I have returning students because it means you like me. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you liked me. You really liked me. Um, so, uh, yeah, survey two, I will be teaching next spring. Um, but if you do teach it with Dana, she does a really good job, so you won't hurt my Survey two is our first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is survey one. Yeah. Uh, that's survey two. It picks up from the Renaissance and goes all the way to Art Made Today. So, a lot again, but we covered a lot in this class. So. And, and we made it. I think it was good. Maybe, maybe not. It's not listed yet, so I don't know. Uh, probably an eight week course, most likely, because they always want me teaching art appreciation. <laughs> we got to cram all those in. So probably eight weeks again. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's what I have for you guys. Uh, I am going to be in here every day. If you need like a quiet space to take your test or Wi-Fi, um, I'm going to be in here every day the rest of this, well, tomorrow and next week uh, with my morning class. I'll just stay in here. So if you want to come in and take your test, you can. Feel free to. Same for you, Grace. If you want to come in and take your test, you can. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, you can come up here and bug me too. I get kind of bored sometimes. Perfect. I clicked submit. I finished it, but after I did it, I like. Oh, I'll open it. Yeah. Cool. I was like. Yeah. I was like, I was trying to go previous and submit. I Yeah. Oh, dang it, I forgot. Okay, we're going to wipes now because we're out of the time. I have the... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I don't really see the point in the office for like four more days. Uh, when I have a bunch of these.